Good evening, everyone, everyone, and thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Tun Shang. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and also the deputy director of the Sakop Sabandu Center for Turkey Studies here at Columbia University. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure and honor um, to welcome you all to today's event where we host three great scholars, wonderful colleagues, and great friends. Uh, Professor Kaya Shahin, Professor Aisha Baltajulu Grammar, and Professor Pierre Mat uh, Mattia Tom Massino. Uh, we are here to celebrate and discuss Professor Shahin's exciting new book, Peerless Among Princes The Life and Times of Sultan Suleiman, which came out only 10 days ago, yeah, I yeah, suppose, uh, from Oxford University Press. And you can find over there flyers where you can. Uh, have a 30% discount if you're interested in buying um, the book. Uh, before introducing our speakers, um, I would like to reiterate uh, how heavy-hearted we all are for um, the loss in Turkey and Syria and after the devastating earthquakes um, almost a month ago. Um, as you all know, um, tens of thousands of people lost their lives, many more lost everything they had. Um, therefore, I want you to consider supporting relief efforts in any form uh, you can. I mean, given the scale of the tragedy, our consistent support is, I think, all the way more important at this stage. Um, to turn back to today's panel, uh, uh, we will first hear from Professor Shahin. Um, about how he came to write a book on um, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. And this is the first comprehensive biography of the Sultan in English uh, after the 1944. Roger Bigelow Merriman's Suleiman the Magnificent. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> So let me introduce uh, Professor Shahin, uh, who is an associate professor of history at Indiana University, Bloomington. Um, he received his PhD in 2007 at the University of Chicago. Uh, he studied with uh, Professor Cornell Fischer, with whom I also um, studied. Uh, Professor Shahin is a, a historian of early modern Ottoman world with a particular interest in history writing, governance, religious and confessional identities, ceremonies, and rituals. Uh, his first book, uh, Empire and Power in the Reign of Suleiman, narrating the 16th century Ottoman world, was published in 2013 by Cambridge University Press and later translated into Turkish in 2014. By Tunçev. Uh, yes, I'm happy <laughs> that I was involved in the it's Turkish translation. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Back in the day. Uh, and Peerless Among Princes is his second monograph. Uh, Professor Shahin has numerous publications on early modern Ottoman history and its connections to the broader Eurasian world, uh, including both the uh, Western Europe and the Islamic world. And he also held several prestigious fellowships, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, SSRC Postdoctoral Fellowship for Trans-Regional Research, and Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship in Middle Eastern Studies. After Professor Shahin, we will turn to Professor Aisha Baltajul Bremer and Professor Pierre Mattia Tomasino. Uh, let me briefly introduce to you my great colleagues and friends. Uh, professor Baltajul Bremer is Assistant Professor of history and Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at NYU. And she is also leading um, the Ottoman and Turkish studies initiative uh, there. She's a specialist in Middle Eastern history with a focus on the early modern Ottoman and Safavid empires. Her forthcoming book, um, tentatively titled Politics of Sectarianism in the Middle East, Ottoman Sunnism, Safavid Shiism, and the Azalbash. I'm not sure if you still have the same title, Aisha? So far, okay, yes. Right. They didn't 
they rejected yet. Okay. <laughs> they won't. It's, it's a wonderful project. So in that book, she examines the Sunni Shiite divergence in the early modern period, not just as a religious rivalry, but as meticulously carried out geopolitical and fiscal battle. And in relation to this topic, she has already published several important articles and book chapters. And Professor Walter Joel Bremer also received various fellowships, including the Andrew Mellon Foundation Fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study. And finally, Professor Pier Mattia Tomasino is an associate professor of Italian at Columbia University. He is an early modernist, and in his research, which focuses on the production, circulation, and consumption of texts, Professor Tomasino explores the intellectual and religious traditions, as well as the scholarly and literary practices between the Italian peninsula and the Muslim world from the 14th through the early 18th century. His first book is Venetian Quran, a Renaissance companion to Islam, uh, initially published in Italian in 2013 and later in English in 2018. And he is currently finishing his second book uh, entitled uh, Port Voices, Courtly Text, Five Observations of Late Medici Orientalism, 1666 to 1673. Uh, and he founded and has been co-chairing the Italian and Mediterranean Colloquium here at Columbia University. So I want to thank again Aisha and Pier Mattia for accepting my invitation to discuss uh, Kaya's wonderful book. Uh, I also want to thank Ararat Shekarian, our project manager, and Khan Erdem, our student assistant, for all their help in organizing this event. Without further ado, I will now turn to Kaya for uh, yeah, saying you. his remarks on his book. Do we stand at the podium? However you wish. First of all, thank you so much for this uh, generous uh, introduction uh, and for your invitation to come and present here. Uh, so I was asked to talk about how I wrote the book. So I will give you kind of the story from the very beginning. It has some cinematic elements in it, but believe me, I didn't make these up. So I was sitting in my office, I think five, six years ago and the phone rang. And that was a voice on the other side saying, you know, I read your first book. I'd like to find a lot. Would you consider writing a biography of Suleiman? First, I thought, you know, it was one of my friends pranking me. <laughs> Adam Shupa came. Uh -huh. uh, so much. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, yeah, the, the person on the other end of the line presented herself, Bonnie Smith. I knew who she was by name. She's a prominent scholar of early modern gender. Uh, so I told her, okay, so like, I'll, I'll think about this, but are people really, you know, interested? I'm so, I said, I have two questions. First of all, get an biography of a great man. You know, I'm reluctant. To do that. Number two, would an American audience be interested at all in Sulem? And she said, look, number one, you know, uh, you don't have to write this as a great man biography. Uh, and number two, Apparently, uh, Oxford University Press uh, had some research done. They asked uh, U.S. undergrads and various institutions about, you know, uh, people whose biographies they would like to read. And among the usual suspects, like Henry VIII and Queen Victoria, came up the name of Sulem. So I said, you know, okay, I'll a bit, and as I do in every important, semi-important, and unimportant decision in my life, I asked my wife, <laughs> should I do this? Good. And she said, you know, if you don't do it and if someone else does it, you'll keep complaining about the book. So like, why don't you do this? <laughs> so that's, you know, you won't do it. Uh, so I decided to write it, but the, fir the, the first incarnation of the book was supposed to be for an undergraduate book. And I wrote it, it was around 40,000 words. Uh, it didn't have notes. You know, it was a very sort of like simple, uh, you know, story of Suleiman's life. The list of suggested readings at the end, that sort of thing. I finished it. 
and I didn't apply for any fellowships or any leads because you know you wouldn't get granted a sort of fellowship in a project like that. So I basically spent my winter breaks, summers, and this and that. And just as I was finishing this first version, I found out that the book series for which it was being considered uh, folded. So for a time, I didn't have any problems. And then I was contacted again by Oxford University Press, but this time by Susan Ferber, who said that she really liked the book. You know, the, the subject deserved a much longer treatment, as a result of which I started working on a more academic book, you know, based on primary sources and you know, footnotes, proper bibliography, that sort of thing. And the result is uh, peerless among princes. So writing a biography like that. Uh, was made possible by the existence of sources, I would call indeed an explosion of sources in the Ottoman realm uh, in the first decades uh, of the 16th century and later. Uh, so I was able to basically use uh, a number of Ottoman sources, you know, regnal, dynastic, universal chronicles, pieces of official correspondence, poetry, uh, you know, sources produced by the Ottoman bureaucracy, but I was also fortunate in the sense that I could also rely on chronicles, diplomatic reports, other kinds of documents produced in Europe as well as uh, in Safavid Iran. So then, while considering a much longer biography of Suleiman, I was comforted by the fact that you know, there were these original sources that I could rely upon. They did not cover everything, and still to this day, we don't know a lot of things about Suleiman's private life or his private thoughts. But at the same time, my intention was not to resuscitate this person. So I, I wasn't that much bothered by that. But you also have gaps in sources about, let's say, you know, uh, for instance, the reasons uh, behind a certain military campaign and this and that. Uh, rather than try to fill those kinds of gaps, I tried to point out, you know, the absences in the sources and kind of you know uh, ask the reader uh, to come up with their own interpretations. Uh, so I was lucky in that regard. But at the same time, I also had to handle uh, and confront a number of uh, legacies. Uh, already during his lifetime, Suleiman was hailed as a skilled military commander, a just ruler, a divinely anointed monarch. The Europeans called him the Grand Turk. He was an awe-inspiring figure, you know, very wealthy, commanding a large army. So the sort of mystification of Suleiman started already during his lifetime. Uh, even in, you know, among the Safavids, who had a lot of reasons to criticize Suleiman's actions, uh, even when you read Safavid sources, you see that there's a lot of uh, sort of you know, uh, respect and almost like a kind of uh, fear vis a vis Suleiman and his might, the Ottoman military machine, all that sort of stuff. After Suleiman died, uh, his legacy uh, continued to be built uh, by subsequent generations. I also have to point out an interesting rift. Especially in the last decades of Suleiman, we see the emergence of a number of critical voices among the Ottoman elite itself. Uh, there are a few political treatises from his final decades in which we see a, a number of different critical voices about the inefficiencies of government, corruption, uh, you know, bribery, uh, uh, patronage, that sort of thing. Uh, these few, these very few yet important voices basically almost completely disappear after Suleiman's death, and we see sort of the, you know his image as lawgiver, as someone who built a kind of a uh, semi-modern bureaucratic state. We see that. You know, these are the uh, aspects of his life that are uh, emphasized constantly all the way into the uh, 20th and 21st centuries during which modern conservative movements, uh, you know, Turkish nationalism or political Islam basically, you know, take up his name and rebuild his image as a sort of as a defender of Sunnism, uh, as the builder of a just and bureaucratic state and that sort of thing. So this is kind of the legacy uh, that I had to deal with and I had to write against. That was one challenge. Uh, there's another kind of uh, legacy uh, that, you know, uh, 
I try to utilize while uh, trying to escape from, and that legacy is the, the image that Suleiman himself tried to build. There are interesting parallels between the images built about Suleiman by other people and the image built by Suleiman himself. And by the image that Suleiman built, I'm talking about number one, his extensive architectural and charitable program. And number two, his patronage uh, of a major versified Persian and illustrated history of his reign called the Suleiman Nama or the Book of Suleiman. That's the other kind of legacy that I had to deal with. It was important for me in the sense that it reflected how Suleiman wanted to see himself and how he wanted to be seen by later generations. But that was also a very time specific legacy. This is the kind of legacy that he wanted to leave behind in the 1550s and 1560s if he were to you know, uh, create this kind of legacy in the 1520s and 1530s. This would have been a sort of different uh, story. But anyway, I, I, so even though Suleiman did not leave autobiographical materials, with the exception of a few pieces of poetry and some correspondence, I tried to look at the Suleiman Name as well as Suleiman's uh, architectural and charitable uh, construction uh, policy as almost like autobi autobiographical elements uh, in order to try to find another uh, dimension. So I said at the beginning that I tried to stay away from the biography of a great man. It's very difficult to do. You may even find it a contradiction in terms that, you know, uh, I would say that. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I, I try to emphasize a couple of things in order to get away from that. Uh, number one, uh, I paid a lot of attention to his childhood and to his youth, to his years before his sultanate. Uh, in the versified history of his reign that Suleiman himself uh, ordered, the story of his life basically starts with him coming to the throne. When we read uh, the other historical works from his reign, it's pretty much the same. There are a few books about the reign of uh, his father in which you, know, you get a few glimpses of him as prince and this and that. But uh, during the reign of Suleiman, basically, uh, his life before coming to, to the throne was seen as irrelevant and perhaps embarrassing because it's the kind of life that really has a lot of contingency, a lot of luck in it. I mean, it's very difficult to find any specific virtue that you could actually give to Suleiman you know, for having become the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So that, that's something that was erased and I tried to uh, restore that. And again, I wanted to emphasize failure, tensions, problems, his late life depression, his struggle with illnesses, you know, his friends relationship with his sons and all of that sort of stuff to kind of create a bit, uh, a bit more uh, nuance. Uh, I also wanted to write a biography of Suleiman uh, because, uh, let me give an example. Uh, Charles V, Suleiman's contemporary, the Habsburg emperor. Uh, Charles V and Suleiman were rivals, and they spent a lot of time scheming against each other, fighting each other's forces, you know, uh, devising an imperial grant policy that would defeat the other side. They also had a very serious, very tangible sort of ideological and cultural competition you know, over the title of universal monarch, universal emperor, and this. And yet, when you read two recent biographies uh, by, uh, on Charles V by Europeanist historians, Suleiman is almost never mentioned. In, it's as if he did not exist. Uh, so writing a biography of Suleiman within the context of his life and time, and emphasizing the relationship between the Ottomans and the Sephardites of Iran and beyond, obviously, you know, all the way to Central Asia and the Indian Ocean. Also, talking about the relationship between the Ottomans and various European and Christian powers of the time, not as an occasional thing, but as one of the mainstays of Ottoman imperial uh, political life, uh, you know, was an important argument to make. I'm not the first one to make this argument, obviously, but it's the kind of argument that needs uh, to be defended again and again and again. So uh, this is another reason why I basically wanted to write 
uh, a biography of Suleiman and kind of place him within this uh, sort of global uh, history context. You know, he was contemporaries with figures very similar to him. You know, Charles V, I already mentioned, if you talk about Francis I and Henry VIII uh, in Europe, Shah Ismail and Shah Thomas in Iran, Ivan IV in Russia, figures like Babur and Akbar in India. And I think this is, it's not a coincidence that all of those so-called great emperors or great kings live around the same time. All of these figures basically uh, lived during a time of intense imperial competition and empire building. All of them resorted to warfare as an instrument of empire building. They sought to establish control over their own elites and aristocracies. Uh, and all of these figures paid particular attention to creating and maintaining a multi-layered reputation as ruler, patron, soldier, and statesman. All of these figures also tried to establish control over religious matters during a time of intense theological debates and spiritual anxieties. And uh, they were also acutely aware of each other. And they openly competed among themselves for control of land and resources as well as uh, for prestige. So a very modern form of rulership was created by these figures and their entourages in this particular period. I would even go so far as to argue that the foundations of the modern states and bureaucracies and of modern capitalist economies were laid down in the midst of the first genuine wave of globalization in human history during the uh, long 16th century. So I wanted to point out that fact. But at the same time, Suleiman and people around him lived and worked in societies in which gender-based racial and religious hierarchies created very conservative male-centric social system and political regimes. So I also uh, underline this sort of uh, you know, fundamental difference. Uh, I would say that our world today emerged from theirs by destroying their world through the mechanism of the modern national state as well as industrial capitalism. But at the same time, some of their hierarchical views, their ideas of leadership and their politicized views of religion are still with us, still waiting to be surpassed. So this is how I see my own uh, foray into the 16th century and why I do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kaya. Uh, I'm going to follow suit. Okay. Yes. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, let me thank for inviting me to, to this lovely event as a commentator and also Kaya for writing this wonderful book. Uh, and also this really tied, this event tied me really well with my graduate seminar, where I usually invite uh, the author of the book to the class, either in person or via Zoom, and you were going to read the book, and it just worked perfectly that my graduate seminar is here today, yeah. <laughs> as a part of the class well, event. Right? Well, welcome you all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in order to stay on task, I'm going to read my comments. Uh, Shahin begins his book by mentioning his hesitation about writing a biography of a great man. And this is an understandable concern, particularly in Western academia, where we can definitely talk this genre as a century. A quick Google reveal search reveals that there are over 18 biographical accounts on Napoleon and 16 on Abraham Lincoln that were all written in the last three decades. But I'm glad to see that Pei didn't let this hesitation stop him from writing this wonderful book, and there are several reasons for, for that. First of all, when we look at the numbers, it becomes obvious that the same saturation problem doesn't exist in the Ottoman Turkish or more broadly Middle Eastern studies. The first name that comes to mind, of course, is Mr. Kemal Atatürk. And even for him, the number of academic biographies is not in the same ballpark with Napoleon or Lincoln or so many other uh, the historical figures that we can think of. Secondly, and in a related note, comprehensive biographies that place these leadership figures in their historical and global context are particularly needed in this field of Ottoman, Middle Eastern, and Islamic studies. And this is exactly what Kaya Shahin achieved in Kirill and Masters. In a beautifully written narrative, Shahin traces the long history of Suleiman's reign, 
starting from his childhood. While delving deep into the intricacies of Suleiman's personality, rulership, and circumstances around him, he successfully rejects the easy way out to explain the complications of Suleiman's character through an emotional lens. Hayat makes this claim very cogently when he says, and I quote, the lure to normalize Suleiman is strong, and we cannot always ask for emotional commensurability with a political authority. Unquote. One thing that therefore quickly emerges from Shahin's narrative is that this is not a story of a great man. Prince Suleiman, or Sultan Suleiman in Hayat's book, is full of vulnerability and hesitation that shape the flow of history significantly. Suleiman is both benevolent and angry, adamant and hesitant, visionary and short-sighted, commanding and frail. It is these nuances, uh, nuanced approach to the life and times of Suleiman that helps the reader to see him truly as a global figure, not just as an Ottoman one, and also a product of his time, not just another mighty ruler of the past. In other words, this book is not to create sympathy or aversion, as Haya uh, mentions for Suleiman, and it's exactly where you land after you finish reading it. You have a man in front of you with many flaws and strengths, whose personality, while shaping the imperial identity of Ali Osman significantly, was also closely tied to being at the right time, at the right place. Another important narrative thread in Kaya's book is Suleiman's self created uh, legacy. From architectural and infrastructural projects to the creation of the lavish historical account Suleiman Name, from the heavy emphasis put on military victories to a new understanding of diplomacy, Kaya aptly shows the processes as well as the actors behind the creation of an image as well as a legacy for Suleiman's name during his lifetime and after his death. In Kaya Shahim's words, very few modern rulers, Ottoman and other, left behind such a detailed, sophisticated body of evidence to make sure they would be remembered in a particular way. And I commend Kaya for actually how meticulously he works on these sources, both material but also written, uh, to, to give us a sense, a tangible sense of the, the creation of that legacy. Kaya also successfully detailed the number of events that became a part and parcel of Suleiman's legacy beyond his control. In other words, this account clearly lay out a number of policies and practices with which Suleiman defied precedent and contributed into how he still remembers Suleiman, from the fact that he was the only legitimate contender for the throne, to his marriage to Hiram, from the execution order of his son, to his stubbornness on insisting costly military moves, and the longevity of his reign, of his reign that indirectly led his alienation from the public over time, all viewed an image for the mighty sultan that was not always mighty, but oftentimes great. Kaya's book is a must read, not only for those who want to know more about Suleiman's personality, but also about empire building and institutionalization in the context of the 16th century Ottoman and Eastern world, world history. Kaya pays substantial attention to a number of policies and practices that Suleiman embraced and their implications for the creation of an Ottoman way of doing things that we always take for grand, granted yeah. without studying and understanding how things got there. And I think Suleiman and his reign suffers from that a lot. Uh, and, and this is a wonderful contribution to seeing how actually convoluted and painful that process is. Suleiman had the luxury or curse of ruling for almost half a century in the very century which was transformative for the whole globe. Kaya's masterful examination of inter-imperial relations particularly with the Habsburgs and the Safavids, places the Ottoman court in the middle of a larger picture. In this regard, another important contribution of his book is restoring Suleiman's place among the major figures of global 15th century. As we are increasingly talking about the importance of integrated or connected history, and as we are increasingly looking at past from the perspective of global history writing, books like this are needed to make this picture even more complete. Here, I would like to raise two questions for them. My first question is about the limits of Sultanic authority. As you all know, simultaneously with the creation of imperial vocabularies, there existed considerable discrepancies between the state run de Cotton's formulas, which prescribed a strictly normative hierarchy, and the day to day policies and practices that the very same actors followed. 
the state or the sultan was not the only real and only actor engaged in real politics in this picture. The subjects themselves often pursued a combination of political, religious, and socioeconomic interests in their interactions with those of the state and its central and provincial affairs for the purpose of guaranteeing safety and security, as well as pursuing advancement. Ultimately, many and oftentimes conflicting geopolitical policies and practices in these domains emerged, coexisted, and shaped each other at the individual and state level. While unyielding imperial discourses dominated the state the circles in the capital, particularly in this case, Istanbul, heavily adaptable and evasive loyalties shaped the inter-imperial contact zones from southeastern Europe all the way to eastern Anatolia over northern Mesopotamia. So in that case, in that regard, my question is that, was this reality a challenge for you while writing a biography of one of the most powerful sultans of all times as we deem it, or as the history deems it? How did you manage to make sure you didn't attribute too much power to Suleiman while also historicizing the consequences of policies and practices that clearly affected the lives of Neil. My second question is related to the first one, and it's about the power of subjects during the long reign of today. In a successful empire, Jane Burbank and Fred Cooper have argued, and I quote, neither consistent loyalty nor resistance, but contingent accommodation was what took place. At the core of the imperial ideologies of the early modern era was Therefore, the implicit principle according to which different people within the polity would be governed differently. As political entities with a great degree of heterogeneity and of reliance on both incorporation and differentiation, most of the imperial centers follow the practice of mixing, matching, and transforming their way of rule or optimum way of ruling to adapt to changing circumstances within and beyond their boundaries. Recognizing the limits as well as the elasticity, of the early modern state and its religious output naturally raises another question at least in my mind. What was then the power of Suleiman's subject? Or what, was, what did it mean to be a subject under the long reign of Suleiman? And what did their subjecthood change over time based on the change in character and, and, and uh, governing style of Suleiman in this almost half a century reign? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, uh, let's continue answer. with your remarks first, Daya. Okay. So Aisha's comments and questions, and then we'll continue yeah, with we'll the yeah, thing. Okay. Thank you so much for these wonderful comments. I mean, it's, 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 I'll ask you to send me a copy. Sure, could, here, I, here you go. <laughs> thank you. I myself couldn't have described my. <laughs> That's you. Better than you there. Right, yes. yeah. So, wonderful questions. Uh, and I'm glad you asked these questions because. Since the focus is on the South himself, uh, the, these kinds of issues sometimes get lost a little bit. Uh, one thing that I did was, I mean, there are these passages in which uh, I give particular attention to these rural rebellions and to succession battles in order to kind of talk about the reaction of the subjects and in order to talk about how the Ottoman uh, political center has to keep the subjects happy and has to protect them. Uh, so I, I, I talk about this sort of mutual relationship, a, a relationship of mutual dependency between the political center and the subjects. Uh, this is something that you see not only in real life, but in a major political text like Knalazade, Ali's Ahlak Ali, in which, and this is something that I've been reading much more closely with a friend of mine uh, over the past year, in it, you see an articulation of a kind of relationship between sultan and subject as a relationship of mutual dependency. So there's even like a political theoretical uh, aspect of it. So I would call that the power of subjecthood, and it's a little bit like a, a kind of like divine law or something like that, or a kind of natural law in which this, the subject is owed you know, equal treatment by the ruler that the ruler is there in order to serve the subjects to a certain extent. Obviously, you know, this, this changes uh, in practical life, but I mean, the, the idea is there. And in these kinds of rebellions or other riots or other actions uh, against the Sultan or against his agents, 
I think that the, the notion that the relationship is one of mutual dependency plays plays a certain role. Uh, so, and I I kind of try to emphasize that 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 the subjects are not an undistinguished and pacified mass by by, by trying to give attention to these uh, riots and rebellions. Uh, also, in the next project on which is on Ottoman uh, ceremonies from the 1450s to the 1580s, I'm trying to tackle the same problem. Uh, only in the case of Istanbul, I don't get out of Istanbul that much, uh, but I think there's a kind of trickle down effect, at least in larger cities as well. Uh, so I'm looking at these circumcision ceremonies for the princes from 1457 to 1582, and during that time period, you see that a ceremony that is organized by the political center in the name of the dynasty is transformed slowly but surely into a kind of urban carnival or urban festival in which the inhabitants of Istanbul, especially the, the, the newly mobile commercial classes are playing very important roles. So I think there's a sort of class element to it as well in a city like Istanbul, as it becomes wealthier and as it becomes, as the Ottomans restore it uh, to its previous sort of economic and geopolitical importance. And as the population increases, as we see the emergence of a kind of more stratified society alongside different social classes, uh, different people, you know, merchants, but also artisans basically start uh, reimagining themselves as constituent parts of the political society. This is something that I see very clearly during the ceremonies and Suleiman contributes to this himself very much. It's the sort of the dichotomy of political power, right? You have to create interlocutors. And while creating interlocutors, you are ruling over them, but you're also empowering. That's, that's, that's sort of a relationship. Uh, to go back to the limits of uh, sultanic authority, I talked about this a little bit in something that I published a couple of years ago called uh, the capabilities and limits of Ottoman governance. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, when we talk about these early modern empires, we always have to uh, tell our readers that we are talking about them with a number of reservations. You know, there are certain parts of the empire over which they have nominal rule. In fact, you know, as you get out outside the city walls of Istanbul, you know, early morning, there's no <laughs> imperial rule, the bandits rule or whatever, I mean, the brigands. I, I think one success of the Ottomans, and I think this is something that we, I mean, we pay a lot of attention to law in the Ottoman case, uh, but I think one aspect that could be discussed more there are treatments of this in the in like case of the 18th century. You know, Boac Ergen, for instance, talks about these kinds of things. But already, I think, in the late 15th century, the Ottomans, the Ottoman political center, imposes itself on these rural communities as a sort of conflict resolution agency, almost. The Ottoman law, in the form of Sharia plus Kanun, basically is given to the local communities as an instrument of rule, obviously, but I more and more think that it's an instrument of peace building and problem solving. So the way that the Ottomans send out cadres, you know, to different parts of the empire where they rule according to Ottoman legislation, as well as pre-existing customary or regional legislation, this creates a kind of loyalty and a kind of hegemonic staying power for the Ottomans. Because, you know, the Ottomans are basically seen as not necessarily of course, in the case of the Alevi communities, it would be different, but I'm talking about, you know, uh, in, about this in general terms. Uh, Ottoman law and the Ottoman agents basically, you know, uh, successfully present themselves as uh, factors of stability. I think that, that, gives them, that gives them a lot of power and a lot of legitimacy, I mean, if it makes sense. Yes. Thank you. Pierre Mathieu. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to read the, the book. Uh, of course, I, for both the sources and also the history and the historiography, I come from uh, a different perspective. And um, when, when you were presenting the book, I was actually thinking about the acknowledgement that you wrote. Yeah. Uh, and, and this acknowledgement actually, they kind of... Uh, um, Summarize the editorial history of this book, no, the, with the, uh, this phone call, uh, yeah. and then the transformation of the book uh, uh, into 
from a textbook into a research book that I found extremely interesting. Also because of, at the end uh, of uh, the acknowledgement, uh, you thank also um, different actors uh, of, uh, of this story and Suleiman's story. You know? And I read, we do not admit enough, however, that the mighty empires on which we write were built on the labor of millions of peasants, artisans, shopkeepers, merchants, and slaves, without whom figures like Suleiman would not or could not have existed. Yeah. And this reminds me something, uh, a, a book that actually I think was a, a turning point, but also a book that we read in class, uh, that was Le, Le Chrétien d'Allah yeah. by Bartolome uh, Benassar. Benassar and Lucille Benassar, that was published in 1989. Uh, that is uh, 200 years after uh, the French Revolution. And in their introduction and acknowledgement, they decide, they said that we are uh, learn more from Menocchio and Manetra uh, than from great biography of great men. You know? uh, so there we have a shift from the biography of the great men to then the biography of uh, uh, renegades. You know? And in the uh, and that's a starting point, a very early starting point of the uh, reception of uh, Italian microhistory in France, but especially biographies. No? Uh, and uh, uh, in the last twenty years, we had this reception of of uh, Italian microhistory, but especially biographies, in uh, more in a more global frame. No, the biography of uh, uh, go-betweeners, the biography of uh, travelers, uh, and so on. So uh, as a genre uh, of not biographies of the great man, but of more less known people, but moved across empires. So for example, uh, Leo Africano, Samuel Pallace, uh, um, uh, Elizabeth Marsh, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, certainly there is, uh, what I see in this biography is, uh, uh, as you said, uh, a biography of a great, of great men, but written in a different way. Uh, and, and certainly there is a, a, a dialogue, I think, and one of my questions is about this with uh, this different tradition of, of global biography that, are, that have been written, especially in the last uh, uh, 20 years. So it seems that there is a, an osmotic uh, relationship between um, uh, this kind of biography, but also the biography of the great man. And this seems um, an interesting book that dialogue also uh, with um, with that tradition, um, uh, also because of the uh, the uh, the idea of putting Suleiman in in a more global, in a more global frame, and in general Ottoman history in, in a global frame. Uh, what is interesting that in that sense, I think in your operation, I used to talk about this is uh, go beyond the self fashioning and the political propaganda and the use uh, of many different sources that are correspondence, uh, 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 many things. Now, poetry, letters, but also marginal notes of payments for, for his children, and also the relazioni and uh, European sources that arrive uh, uh, later on uh, in the 1520s. So, for example, for me, uh, as a uh, person that's more familiar with the uh, European sources on the Ottoman Empire of, of that period, uh, I think the uh, the first chapters are very illuminating you know, because of the chapter on the childhood and upbringing and the adolescence, which are also uh, chapters not only on, about single people, but also about spaces, urban spaces. Yeah. For example, there is a uh, the first chapter is a um, few pages that describe in a very simple but very rich way how Trebson was uh, yeah. in the uh, at the beginning of the 16th century. So I think one of the merit of this book is also that it's not just about people, but is about urban spaces and also social spaces. No, uh, one of the um, the great achievement I think is to put uh, Suleiman's down of the pedestal but continuously dialogue with a large number of people you know, that are 
certainly Ibrahim, certainly Hurem, but also the entire bureaucracy. You know? So there is this question of uh, share agency that, that also at the end of the book, uh, you recall a, a sort of tradition no? in yeah. uh, not isolating the, the great man, but putting his agency within um, uh, a social space. No? If I could jump in, please. please. This was, uh, thank you so much for all of these remarks. And this was exactly one sort of solution I had in my mind to give primacy to space and to external circumstances, but also to other figures around him so that this could be to a certain extent, almost like a collective uh, biography. Exactly. So I think the, you're giving this sense that it's yeah. a choral uh, uh, biography and actually explicitly saying now that you, you want him not just to be, while Ottoman works of history present Suleiman as the main agent to this action were relied with the assistance of the governing apparatus yeah. and yeah. so on. Yeah. So there is this question of agency that is a sheer agency. Yeah. And of course, with the privilege uh, uh, relationship with the uh, Grand Vizier yeah. and uh, with the uh, Hurem. Yeah. Um, so my question, my two main questions are how biography and uh, global microhistory influence the biography of mm -hmm. great men. And how was your dialogue? And also, what 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 was your journey through this new genre? What did you learn about biography and so on? And also, the other question is about Suleiman the poet. Uh, because you use a lot of the his uh, uh, poems uh, as historical sources uh, as to describe also this relationship no as uh, yes. so so your reading is very relational no? yeah. uh, so if you want to expand a little bit about uh, Suleiman as a poet too. yes wonderful thank you so much so Talking about the influences, uh, one of the first influences I have in mind is a French novelist, Marguerite Ursula. Mm -hmm. She wrote uh, a book called The Memoirs of Hadrian. Uh, I don't know if the younger generations would, yeah. but I feel as I get older that like the, the stuff that we would read while growing up is increasingly irrelevant. Every generation must feel that. But anyway, the Marguerite Ursula's uh, memoirs of Hadrian uh, and her postscript. That was one influence that I've had in my mind for a number of years, because in that postscript, Margaret Ursenal talks about age, biological age, also the way we see age, our own body, our own person, you know, as we go through time and have thinking about that relationship had an impact on the way Ursenal wrote the bio, it's not a biography of Hadrian. She imagines that she's writing the, a kind of autobiography of Hadrian as he thinks about his life before he dies and that sort of thing. But so she says in somewhere in her postscript that, you know, she had that idea all, like when she was 18, but she had to wait until her early to mid 40s to write it. So this may be like a, something that too personal to share, but I really think, you know, it, it, my younger self would not be able to see it in this particular way. I would talk a little bit more about the institutions and this and that, I would think that the person was more irrelevant and kind of, I, I think I was able to see his sort of middle-aged conundrum, you know, like uh, following his duty, trying to live the way he wanted to live, all of those kinds of, you know, issues that it's, that they made more sense to me in this particular region. I'm in my late forties. That's one thing. Uh, the global biography, microhistory genre. Again, I mean, like in Turkey, when we were in college, the Turkish translation of uh, the cheese and the worms came out. <laughs> it was uh, everybody wanted to be a microhistorian, you know, uh, or at least you were the editor at the publishing uh, house. Yeah, I published yeah, I worked as an editor at the publishing house that published the Turkish translation. But uh, I was in my early twenties then, and you remember, I mean, not everybody, but our circles of friends were like, "Oh, this book is wonderful." So that's obviously, you know, it has been uh, wanting at the back of my mind, especially uh, the way you know Ginsburg makes the background, the context shine through, you know. That was really fascinating because you know in the Turkish tradition a biography was a, as a, in everywhere else the life of a great person who did this who did that blah 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 right I mean so Menokio's story was the kind of 
the first sort of like biography resonate or whatever you call it, the, 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 the full context. And so the, hu the human figure came alive in particular ways. And so that was something important. Uh, Georges Duby's Guillaume Le Maréchal was another thing that I've had at the back of my mind. Uh, because uh, again, in Istanbul, I wrote an MA thesis. Uh, Boazici had this uh, historiography class mm -hmm. for the first year MA students. Everybody would pick like a famous historian and write about them. And I picked Georges Duby because I knew French. Uh, so I remember being intrigued by the fact that, you know, that his someone with that sort of anal uh, background would end up writing a biography, something that, you know, the entire tradition is against. And he explains it himself in his introduction. So, mm -hmm. and he talks about how, you know, like it's the, the human agency, the risk to lose the human agency in that kind of history that may become overly structural at terms. And, you know, there are, there are moments in which we can stop and, you know, like try to look at things through, through the lens of human agency. Uh, that sort of thing. So these are the kinds of uh, influences that I had. I have had at the back of my mind for two decades. Uh, so talking about his poetry, are we out of time? Almost? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So I like his poetry very much. I find him to be, and I hadn't read his poetry to that extent before this book. You know, growing up in Turkey, going to high school, we are exposed to it the same gazelles or, you know, like couplets by him, that sort of thing. I mean, you are told that he was a distinguished poet, but what does it mean? Reading his poetry, and I, he also has a Persian divan, much smaller uh, than his Ottoman production. He is one of the most productive poets of the Ottoman tradition. I haven't, you know, uh, counted, you know, the number of gazelles of every other poet, but you know, like uh, it, it, is, it is obvious that he's, he's one of the most productive uh, poets. His Persian poetry is more imitative. It's very well written. And I had long conversations with my colleague, Paul Lozensky about this. It's very imitative of the Tabriz school of the 15th century. Job well done. He, he had a very good training in, in, in poetic education, in Arabic and Persian, and his education is reflected in his Persian poetry. But in his Ottoman poetry, uh, very much like everything else in his life, his Ottoman poetry is located at a moment of transition when the Anatolian or Turkish speaking literati and others, uh, the Bosnian speaking Muslim literati as well, they are starting to write more and more in Ottoman Turkish. So Ottoman Turkish is becoming the language of historiography as well as poetry. And we see that transition in Suleiman's poetry as well, in the sense that later examples of Ottoman poetry are very highly stylized. But his, but his poetry is a mixture of inherited tropes and vocabulary as well as a very colloquial Turkish. So I find his poetry to be very intimate through his integration of the Turkish colloquial into a very stylized uh, vocabulary and style. And his poetry is also important because like, it is clear that some of these are written for his wife, right? And it, it's, it's fairly difficult to find those kinds of connections and associations in, in Ottoman poetry. Uh, but in his case, and again, I was able to ascertain that, you know, a couple of his poems were written in a response to his childhood friend, you know, about how to deal with the, the Safavids and stuff like that. Uh, so his poetry, has this very personal, very intimate aspect. And it's I, less codified, but also is this transitional yeah, yeah, moment of yeah, Turkey, yeah, Ottoman yeah, Turkish exactly. language that make it exactly. more real. Yeah, and also uh, it has a very performative side of it. He performs on the written page as sultan, as lover, as mystic, as a devout believer. So I really think that, you know, and. I made a rough calculation in that regard. I mean, like it's, I have a sense that he wrote or revised a couple of poems of five to six couplets every single week of his life. And this is a life he spends on campaign while out hunting and this and that. I'm fairly certain that writing poetry and editing his poems was a lifelong you know, uh, activity for him. And he did see himself as a poet very much as well. So uh, 
the, the performative aspect of it. And I, I, I also think without psychologizing him too much that he found a refuge in it, kind of refuge in which he could sublimate the tensions of his everyday life by performing as a mystic, by taking refuge in God's mercy or in the love of his wife, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's very tangible, but it's very tragic because it is the least visible part of his legacy. Because of the language changes, modernization, the change in the alphabet and everything, only specialists can read and understand his poetry. Uh, and I call it tragic because he himself very much wanted his poetry to be read after his death. And he, it, we know this because he did the edition of his own collections, I think three times at least. So he wanted to make sure that you know, he would choose his best poetry and leave it to posterity. But very few people can read and understand it now. While it is the most intimate part of his legacy, but it's, it's invisible. And thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to open the floor for questions and comments from our audience shortly, but let me use the privilege of being the moderator here yes. to address some questions. Please. I have a long yeah. list of questions, but I'm going to ask just two of okay. those. Uh, well, thank you again, Kaya, for writing such a beautiful, thank beautiful you. book. Um, a couple of years ago, um, another biography uh, was written by Liz Pierce on Suleiman's wife, yeah. Roxalana, yeah. the Ram Sultan. And I kind of, kind of remember Les de Pierre saying that she was very influenced by the TV series. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, what was it? Magnificent uh, Century. What? Yeah. Magnificent, Magnificent, Magnificent Century. Magnificent Century. I mean, uh, certain portions of the TV series helped her, as far as I, you know, yeah. remember from our conversations with Les. Um, framing your narrative or yeah. looking at some connections yeah. within that narrative. I wonder whether fiction had any influence on you during the writing process yeah. in a positive or a negative way. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was such an influential TV yeah. series yeah. that we can't really imagine certain figures and certain events yeah. without yeah. thinking of those episodes. Of course. Uh, as I was saying in, in answer to uh, Pierre Mathieu's question, uh, Margaret Yurson, our other historical novels that I read recently, Hilary Mantel's uh, Wolf Hall uh, trilogy, those are the kinds of things that I sound like a super westernized Turk, like with all these European you know, references and stuff like that. But those are the kinds of things that had the most influence on me in, in terms of kind of, you know, thinking about the flow of the narrative in my mind, what to emphasize. So like fiction in that regard, literature, uh, I was thinking of doing comparative literature and I decided to become a historian because I thought I could also do comparative literature under the garb of history, but not necessarily history under the you know, cloak of comparative literature. Uh, so yeah, in that regard, I mean, fiction, uh, narrative style, all of those things had, you know, uh, an impact on the way I have seen the project itself. Uh, talking about the television series, I am a little bit conflicted about it. Uh, I like Leslie Pierce's book very much. Uh, I think she did a great job, especially considering that we don't have a lot of sources about her, unlike Suleiman, you know, and, uh, you know, due to a variety of reasons, I mean, uh, women become royal or dynastic women become quite prominent under Suleiman, but we are not yet at the point in which they play roles that would require documentation as we see in later centuries. So that's a very difficult thing to do. As for the series itself, so they look at the series and they look at the ways in which Suleiman wanted himself to be remembered in his Suleiman Nama. There are these interesting parallels. Suleiman the fighter, you know, Suleiman the universal monarch and all of that sort of stuff. So to a certain extent, the sort of idealized legacy that Suleiman wanted to leave is taken up in the television series. It also has the advantage of democratizing and popularizing these kinds of historical themes. You will remember, and you will remember how uh, political Islamists in Turkey were pissed off. Yeah. You know, by, he was drinking alcohol. Yeah, drinking alcohol. He does. <laughs> and he was having sex <laughs> yeah. out there. Yeah. As I prove in my book, he never had sex and he never drank alcohol. 
and he got gout and he can I talk about I me mean, you do get gout for uh, drinking wine and eating a lot of red meat yeah. <laughs> and like it's even his doctors were saying like or uh, I think it was the Italian ambulance that he stopped drinking I mean it's very clear it's like, he has a new diet. Anyway, it's ridiculous. But so in that regard, the TV show really helped kind of democratize the image of Suleiman by kind of taking it away from these idealized 20th century conservative reimaginings. But my problem with the TV show is that it repeats the problematic issues as well. It never questions slavery. Uh, it never questions violence. You know, Suleiman goes on a campaign and stuff like that. While it's very clear, I remember this dialogue between Ibrahim Pasha and some of the Habsburg envoys, and the Habsburg envoys are complaining about the violence and the, the, the killing and the, of civilians and the destruction of property, and Ibrahim Pasha sounds embarrassed. And again, these diplomatic reports may be stylized, but you know, you develop this feeling that it sounds genuine. Ibrahim Pasha says, we are very sorry. We, we don't want that to happen, obviously, but it's very difficult to control soldiery during these campaigns. And then he blames the Habsburgs. He says, if you were doing the right thing, we wouldn't have to you know, uh, fight with you and bring 100,000 people into Central Europe and stuff like that. So even the contemporaries are conflicted about you know, violence or even about slavery and this and that, while nothing of that sort is problematized in the TV show. So in Leslie's case, I understand that she would see the TV show with a different eye in the sense that it gives a lot of visibility to Huram. Mm -hmm. But in my case, I mean, Suleiman is already very visible and the show kind of makes him even more visible, but pretty much in all the wrong ways uh, related to patriarchy or violence mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of my issue with it. But at the same time, as I said, I like the fact that you know it brings these figures to the fore uh, to be discussed. I'm going to give another example. Hillary Mantle's uh, Woolfolk Trilogy was a major literary event uh, in the UK or in the English-speaking world, uh, and it's a it's a wonderful uh, trilogy. But at the same time, without TV, a TV show like The Tudors, mm -hmm. would it have had this much of influence? Perhaps not. So I guess, you know, those kinds of popular treatments open avenues for writers and for historians through which they can burrow into the public discourse and say something else. My other question is about the legacy yeah. that you also mentioned during your remarks. I mean, for us, the Turcophone scholars and students, yeah. Suleiman is almost always the lawgiver. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in the English speaking, I mean, for the English speaking audience, and thanks especially to this TV show, yeah. he's known as the Magnificent. Yeah, yeah. You also touch upon this changing narratives about Suleiman's identity and legacy in your conclusion, yeah, yeah, how yeah. it changed over time. And by time, we speak about five centuries here. Yeah. Could you comment on the changing legacy of Suleiman from let the lawgiver to Magnificent? Yeah, so after, as I said, during his lifetime, there are a lot of European commentators on Suleiman's life, Suleiman's activities. After Suleiman dies, then we look at the Ottoman tradition and when we look at the European tradition, his legacy kind of follows two different paths. On the European side and the European, uh, you know, diplomats and writers continue producing a lot of writings on the Ottomans. Uh, but Suleiman, as time goes by on the European side, kind of becomes a stock figure. The, the nuances kind of disappear, and he becomes this sort of like figure frozen in history. In the Ottoman tradition, to the contrary, people keep basically discussing him. So in, in the last decade of his reign, as I was saying, there are these kinds of uh, critical voices. Uh, so when we look at the Ottoman tradition, these critical voices continue for a very long time. Uh, so in the decades after his death, or you know, in the early 17th century, Kochibe, for instance, the sort of reformer, thinks that you know, certain uh, problems that afflict the Ottoman administrative system started under Suleiman. Mustafa Ali, the historian you know, who writes in the last decade, who his history in the last decades of the 16th century, basically also says that, you know, certain things like the undermining 
of meritocracy, too much patronage and stuff like that. These things started uh, under Suleiman. So this, those critical voices exist. But at the same time, you have uh, works like the second volume of the Funer Nabe, in which you see the emergence of Suleiman as a sort of like generous, charitable, kind figure. So the Ottoman tradition is kind of filled with different views of Suleiman. It's much richer uh, than the European tradition. Uh, and thanks to those kinds of, you know, those kinds of images, as the Ottoman enterprise loses ground in Europe and in the East, as the Ottoman administration suffers, you know, a variety of problems, uh, people need to reinvent, you know, these historical figures that will give justification to reform it. In. So in the mid to late 17th century and in the 18th century, you see the emergence of Suleiman the lawgiver, basically, which is really interesting because Suleiman used to be criticized by bureaucrats in the earlier centuries while you know, uh, promoted and applauded by people close to the court. And then later on, the bureaucrats take up the image of Suleiman and they become the main promoters of Suleiman. Uh, he becomes the lawgiver. And then in the 19th century, uh, basically, uh, he becomes in you know Ahmed Jaldad Pasha really is the founder of this bureaucratic rationality. And if, if the empire were, were to follow that bureaucratic rationality, you know it would finally uh, be able to become more efficient, more resistant to external pressures, that sort of stuff. And again, that image of Suleiman as state builder and stuff like that is something that that also exists uh, in in the uh, in the modern Turkish uh, scholarship. Uh, but that becomes at the expense of the personal elements that you see in the Yunan. So Suleiman, the individual, basically disappears under below this mountain of you know bureaucratic achievement. He kind of basically becomes faceless. So just as he kind of you know becomes frozen in time as the magnificent in the European tradition, he also becomes frozen as the lawgiver uh, in the Ottoman and then in the Turkish tradition, even, even though his treatment is much more. Mm. much more nuanced. Uh, I think our generation of scholars did, did a good job by revisiting the 16th century, obviously under the influence of our mentors and advisors. Uh, and I think when I look at the treatment of Suleiman or the long Ottoman 16th century, ours is the first generation that kind of started establishing a new way of looking at it that's much more nuanced. We are talking about tension, violence, intra-Islamic conflict. We are talking about people around Suleiman. I think you know the, the dissertations produced under uh, Cornel Flasher are to a certain extent a kind of group biography of Suleiman, you know, the kind of stuff that he wrote about different figures around him. So, uh, but it's also interesting that all of this scholarship or almost all of the scholarship has been produced in the United States in English by people of Turkish extraction. Yeah. Um, we can take some questions, comments. Hi, my name is Sumit. I'm a student here. Um, and thank you for the talk. I'm, I'm talking about your book. I'm interested in reading it. We'll get it soon. So I'm curious to learn about when you were writing this book, were there any sort of your personal beliefs Personal biases or religious beliefs, were they playing a role with when you're writing a book? If that all they did, how did you try to mitigate them or to work on them? And my second question is in your title, Fearless, what does that fearless refer to? Does it refer to within the Ottoman Empire or the fearless across the globe? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful questions. Bias, I think our uh, training as historian does a good job of telling you to keep your biases out of the picture. Uh, so in that regard, that was not a major challenge. Uh, to the contrary, I tried not to sound too disrespectful. Uh, I mean, Suleiman is a devout Muslim, obviously, right? Uh, so I, I made sure to mention that next to him drinking alcohol and <laughs> doing the other stuff. So I, I tried to kind of, you know, talk about these things in, in a kind of more balanced way. Uh, uh, otherwise, I think we receive a good training in historiography, and so it's it's part of our training not not to bring those those biases into the into the situation. Thank you for asking me about the title. That's another interesting story. Uh, so I was discussing it with the editor and with the editorial board, mm 
the title came uh, from a poem that Suleiman wrote uh, for his son, Prince Mehmed, who dies in 1543 of a, uh, of a contagious disease. Uh, he is Suleiman's favorite son with his wife, Hurem, and he's really very, very affected by the whole thing. Uh, so he has his corpse built to Istanbul. There's this you know, huge funeral uh, prayer ceremony. And he also writes this uh, poem uh, for his son. And the repeating line is, Shehzadeler Güzidesi Sultan Mehmedim which means careless among princes, my Sultan Ben, right? I also gave a translation of it in the book. And someone in the editorial board, I don't know who it was, really liked it. And they said, you know, like, you don't have to, this is something that applies to Suleiman as well. So why don't we use it as a title? And again, after a discussion with my wife, <laughs> I never want to take these decisions by myself. We thought, you know, it's a good title. It's a catchy title. So it comes from Suleiman's own poetry but it's something that he said for his favorite son. We thought it would apply to him as well. I thought this was like a double entendre while talking about also the fact that he literally didn't have a contention competition. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Power, right? exactly. <laughs> so yeah. he was peerless. Yeah, yeah, he was peerless. There's that. And he did see himself as superior to Charles V, yeah. that time, must yeah. Francis V first. So there's sort of element and it's an expression that yeah. comes from his own poetry. So it felt, it felt right. Yes, you know? yes. Excellent questions, and I'll give partial answers. The, the first one, I think it's possible not to use Magnificent or Lawgiver. I never use them in my book forehead, only when I'm making a historiographical you know, discussion, I attribute them to other people. Uh, but I thought, you know, calling him Sultan Suleiman was fair, because it was, you know, it is the main uh, sort of uh, duty or position or function that he had uh, throughout his life. But yeah, I consciously stayed away from saying the lawgiver or the magnificent because it, it, it feels like it subscribes you to a specific historiographical tradition. And I wanted to get away from both the Orientalist and Turkish nationalist and Islamist traditions while writing that. So it is possible to get away from that. We don't have to use those labels for those people. And Suleiman himself did not use those kinds of labels for himself. That's that's the other thing. So like, you know, uh, nobody could claim that, you know, they have a super legitimate reason to use them for Suleiman. I mean, like it's just he himself, he, he, he called himself with different titles and he was called with different titles throughout his life. I, I tried to pay special attention to that. So his name Suleiman, which is Solomon uh, in Turkish or Arabic, uh, had a lot of significance for him and his contemporaries. So he was called the Solomon of the age, the second Solomon. He was called the master of the age, the master of the auspicious conjunction. This was one of my suggestions for the book title, 
but the editor rightfully said, <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, yeah, master of the auspicious conjunction. We barely know what, what it means uh, after studying Kornel Fleischer for yeah, many, many years. Anyway, uh, so. Why now? Why now? Yeah, I've been thinking about it myself. I mean, there have been other examples. Uh, Lewis, Norman Lewis, study of Naima. Yeah, is it Norman Lewis? No, Norman Lewis is a travel writer. Lewis, Jeffrey Lewis Thomas. Lewis Thomas, yeah. yes. As I get older, I cannot like, I, I, I can't remember the, the, the names and titles that I could remember when I was younger. So there's Lewis Thomas's A Study of Naima. Uh, there is uh, Cornel Fleischer's book, Bureaucrat and Historian, or Mustafa Ali. So those are not biographies per se, but I would say my approach is close to Cornel Fleischer's in the sense that obviously he's our mentor. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I talk about context as well as personal life. So there were examples, but the recent proliferation has to do, I think, uh, with the fact that, you know, we are Ottoman historians existing in an Anglo-Saxon or English speaking cultural sphere in which uh, there are some cultural priorities and cultural demands that are different than the cultural priorities that people have in Turkey or writing traditions and stuff like that. I agree with you. I mean, when you look at the, uh, I look at the uh, Turkish Higher Education Authority's webpage for dissertations to see what people are doing. Uh, it's mostly uh, editing, you know, uh, original sources, this and that. Uh, and if you're in a, in a Turkish literature department, you edit somebody's collection of poetry. If you're in a history department, it's either like a uh, court register or a land survey register or something like that. I mean, that's, and I am not against that. That's very good training. And in a lot, in a lot of European traditions, you have the same thing. Like if, if you were to get uh, a, an MA in medieval history from the Sorbonne, you would probably you not know, do something very similar. Like uh, the, you know, the editing of a, a primary source or something like that. But I mean, it's, writing a biography, why not? It's very interesting because the Turkish historical culture is very deferential towards these figures of the great man. And yet, I mean, do you have any idea? I mean, it's, it really is the way the culture, the long direct culture shapes up. I mean, biography, autobiography, memoirs, these are not really genres that are as popular as they are in the West. In the West. One of my former professors at the University of Chicago once told me that Biographies of sultans always sell. Yeah. You know, I think that sell in the U American context. Yeah, yeah, in the American sense. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. I totally agree with you. You know, yeah. the cultural demand yeah. here. Yeah. And it's not a demand, actually. It's kind of an imposition on us a coming from a different uh, perspective. But, you know, yeah. we had to, or we have to, you know, address the audience here in the US, yeah, 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 there yeah. is that sort of imposition exactly. beyond demand yeah. factor. That kind of, that's kind of what I wanted to underline. That's why I always tell the story of how I ended up writing this book. I was basically invited mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Uh, by the way, there's a recent Suleiman biography produced uh, in Turkish by Feridun Emecan. For those of you who read Turkish, I also highly recommend that biography. Uh, so that's kind of an exception to the rule. Although Emerjan also wrote a biography of Yavuz Selim. So, but this is a scholar at the towards the end of his career who basically you know uh, has a lot of experience in Ottoman sources and this and that, social history, administrative history, and so he's basically kind of writing these things as a major sort of like achievement. I would say like at the end of his career, it, it really is a wonderful. Uh, I don't know if you read it yet. It's it's a great biography. And we exchanged our biographies during the writing mm -hmm. process. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Ferdinand Mejia's biography is an exception uh, to the rule. I mean, there are really these figures like Ibrahim I. He did leave behind, you know, like personal writings and stuff like that, or Murad III. Yeah. You could write really readable and interesting biographies of those figures, but it never, it, it doesn't exist in the tradition. And an English speaking audience would never demand a biography of Murad III or Ibrahim I because those are not figures 
So in a way that Suleiman, the magnificent and the persistence of that legacy culminates mm -hmm. in a demand for a new biography of Suleiman in English in the 21st century. That's sort of that. Thank you very much for this. Obviously, I haven't read it yet, but I will. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned your interest in Suleiman as a patron of architecture. Yeah. Now, I'm very sure I thought you know, that you probably had done such a comprehensive job on that topic. Yeah. Um, that I thank you very much for taking the same topic over again. But I'm also very curious as to the perspective from which you approach today, man, that yeah. you really did not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, she's another person with whom I've been in contact throughout the writing process. And like you, I, I admire her work very much. Uh, and I relied uh, on her work to a large extent. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, she did write the definitive work on Mimar Sinan, and she also wrote these articles on different aspects of, you know, Suleiman's architectural patronage and this and that. So obviously, number one, I could not go into as many details as uh, she does. And I'm not trying to necessarily uh, distinguish myself from what she did, but in, in my narrative itself, I, so Gulru Nejapol wrote the Mimar Sinan book from the perspective of Sinan as well as Suleiman and all the others who basically you know, uh, ordered these uh, construction projects. I kind of try to bring the architectural agenda together with the writing of the Suleiman. I try to look at them kind of together and I try to also place it at an important turning point in Suleiman's life, the passage into middle age and the growing concern for leaving behind a more tangible legacy. That sort of thing. Uh, but I mean, in terms of the analysis of space and this and that, I very much relied on, uh, on Gilru and Ejibol as well. And yeah. I mean, that's the other thing, the collective aspect of the scholarship. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a long period and there are so many sources, it's very difficult to write this thing single-handedly. So, and uh, I also made sure to measure it in the, in the acknowledgements that you know, I owe a debt to generations of Ottoman historians who have put together different pieces to puzzle. Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about how uh, Suleiman would have liked to be known himself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we know him as the Kalan yeah. uh, giver and uh, all magnificent. And you mentioned about his poetry and mentioned architecture now. But the, in your study, the, the biographical book, there's a lot of emotional stuff uh, also going on. Uh, yeah. In your uh, hard reading, since you said that he played an important role in the way he formulated his own identity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how would he like to be known? Yeah. Boy, the uh, you know, merciful one, because uh, he was very kind to his son. Uh, yeah. She's not there with his normal commission in the middle of the jungle. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't very good to his father, I understand. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how would he like to be known? So those are definitely the kinds of things that you know he wanted to be known for. And again, another sort of tragic thing about his life is, and I use tragic objectively, not you know, so as the coexistence of two, two contradictory things in his life, he wanted to be a mighty sultan and surpass his father's legacy. But it's it also appears that he wanted. He really sought for the comforts of a kind of family life in the middle of a system that precluded anything like that. You know, I mean, Ottoman dynastic politics, it's very harsh. You know, you have to, you have sex with concubines, produce hopefully one son with each, and then go to the next one so that, you know, you, we produce a pool of princes who fight it out among themselves when the time comes and this and that. He really tried to establish kind of family life, he, he, he failed at that, basically, the kind of family life he established imploded. Uh, so 
in terms of, you know, at a personal level, I get the sense that he definitely wanted to be known as a kind of poet. Number two, as a charitable person, because he really followed a very meticulous construction agenda all over the empire, basically. Uh, but there are certain places like Jerusalem, like Damascus, like Mecca and Medina and Istanbul, where you know, his uh, architectural uh, and charitable activities basically reach a, a, a summit, which tells you that he wanted to also be known you know, to the community of Muslims. So he wanted to leave tangible markers of his existence in Mecca and Medina, you know, visited by Muslims all over the world, or in Damascus, a major, you know, crossroad and commercial city, or Jerusalem, again, another, uh, you know, center of pilgrimage and visitation by Muslims and this and that. Then look at his Suleiman Name, and when you read some Italian diplomatic reports from the fifth, late 1550s, early 1560s, he was very much bothered by rumors about him that he had his son Mustafa executed. He had Mustafa's baby son executed. Uh, his other son Bayezid you know, escaped into Iran, but he was executed there together with his children on the orders of Suleim. And so during his last years in Istanbul, you know, among the, you know, popular classes, his uh, basically, you know, image was not a very favorable. He was seen as this sort of ruthless guy who had a lot of people killed and this and that. And there are certain passages in the Suleiman Name. Uh, the Suleiman Name doesn't talk about the Prince Selim affair or anything like that. It ends around 1550 uh, with the Yusma Mustafa rebellion. Uh, but it talks about the execution of Prince Mustafa, and you see that he, he also wanted to defend himself and his image as someone who wanted to do the right thing. So that's a strange thing to say, but I mean, I, I think he, he himself was bothered by the fact that he had to have two of his sons executed together with their sons. And he wanted to create a defense, defensive argument against that. And he also wanted to be someone known for respecting his promise. His departure on his last campaign, Zigetvar, on the one hand, I think it has to do with his notion of masculinity. He's very old and very sick, but he wants to go on campaign one last time. But he also sounds very serious about fulfilling his promise to Prince John Sigismund that he would defend him against the Habsburgs. It's all over the documents and the historical accounts. Like he's, he's Adam. It's like, you know, I made you a promise. I'm coming. I will fulfill that promise. Like it's, you know. Uh, maybe one last question because we are running out of time. Okay. Um, so I would like to ask you to talk a little bit about your thoughts on the slightly popular framework of the early modern generation. Yeah. Um, the idea of uh, global stability and uh, analysis in the process of this digitalization and society yeah. and if and how this framework is <laughs> he will answer all my no. So early modern, when we came to graduate school in the early 2000s and then throughout the 2000s, uh, these kinds of concepts, they had been in place before in the works of scholars like Joseph Fletcher, but during our graduate education, they were made more popular by the works of Sanjay Subramaniam. And you know, our mentor at the University of Chicago, Cornell Flusher, basically always wanted us to address these kinds of questions. So the notion of a world that is more connected than before, I think, is an undeniable one. And it's well proved when we talk about the 16th century in a global scale. Uh, and talking about early modern Eurasia also uh, makes sense from a scholarly perspective, as well as from a political perspective, as I would say. You know, because it, 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 it's a good instrument to use against Orientalism or against Islamocentrism, against all of those kinds of sentences. You know, to talk about early, so also to talk about global early modernities. That's another concept that I like uh, because, for, again, from a political perspective, 
rather than assuming that the North, Northern European variant of historical transformation was the norm, we can talk about different societies, different cultures, different potential pathways to a kind of, uh, you know, to a new kind of state building, uh, the emergence of new kinds of exchange-based economies in regional and global levels, that sort of thing. But there's also a risk, and I realize this. So one sort of uh, minor confession, I realized I espoused it myself with particular enthusiasm when I was younger, and so did some others, but other people did not do that. Those kinds of concepts also tend to obscure, if you overdo it, they tend to obscure local changes, variations, and this and that. So it has to be in our minds, but very much like the question on governance and governmental efficiency that Aisha asked. Those are the kinds of questions that explain a lot, but there are always multiple exceptions. So we have to be mindful of those kinds of exceptions as well. Not everything is connected. You know, not everything suddenly becomes modern or modern. But all, from a political perspective, but also from a scholarship perspective, I, I, I continue to think that it is, it is a valid concept, but I more and more think we have to use it with, with more caution. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but uh, you are more than welcome to uh, converse with Professor Shahin after, uh, after the talk. Well, thank you, Kaya. Thank, thank you, so you Aisha. Thank you, Pierre Mattia, for this lovely thank conversation. You.